Good morning. I'm Richard Goodman, a trustee of the Washington Institute. I'm honored to serve as chair of this closing session of uh, the 2012 Weinberg Conference. A year ago, almost to the day, our next speaker was part of a small group gathered to watch on a secure TV monitor the, uh, as the raid on Osama bin Laden's compound unfolded. Uh, Mr. McDonough was there as part of that group because he's a close advisor and foreign policy confidant of the president, a person to whom Mr. Obama turns for advice and counsel at critical moments. When the situation is gray, the repercussions profound, and there is no obvious path to success. A native of Minnesota, Mr. McDonough holds an undergraduate degree from St. John's University and a master's degree from Georgetown University. He came to the White House from Capitol Hill, where he was a top foreign policy advisor to former Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle and to then uh, Senator Barack Obama. It was during the campaign that he forged a bond with a candidate that would carry over to the White House. After the election, he joined the national security staff as head of strategic communication and later became the NSC chief of staff. In October 2010, when Tom Donilon became national security advisor, Mr. McDonough succeeded him as deputy national security advisor. And you may recall, at this conference last year, Mr. Donilon delivered the keynote address. Mr. McDonough plays a key role in every issue on our conference agenda, from the Iran nuclear challenge, to the fight against terror, to building the U.S.-Israel relationship. Before I call our speaker to the podium, I want to remind everyone that we're streaming live and that after our speaker's remarks, he has agreed to take a handful of questions, totally unscripted, I may add, with our moderator and his former NSC colleague, Dennis Ross. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome to the Washington Institute Special Assistant to the President and Deputy National Security Advisor, Dennis McDonough. Good morning, everybody. Richard, thank you for those uh, very nice comments. And thank you as well for the uh, terrific leadership you've shown through your challenge grant to the Washington Institute. Uh, uh, I want to, having dri just driven up, I want to thank all of you as well for foregoing a round of golf uh, to be in here this morning. Uh, I know that's probably not an easy call. It wouldn't be an easy call for me. So, uh, Chairman uh, Howard Berkowitz, President Marty Gross, founding president uh, Barbie Weinberg, and most especially uh, Executive Director, Director Rob uh, Satloff, distinguished trustees and everybody here, thank you very much for the opportunity to be a part of this important discussion. I want to express special thanks to the person who invited me here today and a person for whom I would do anything, Dennis Ross. And I would do anything for Dennis, uh, principally because of everything he's done for the country. Uh, a source of great wisdom, a possessor of unbelievable experience, and a person of limitless patience. I want you to know, Dennis, how dearly we miss you. And while we tried everything we could to talk you into extending, uh, and extending yet again, incidentally, we understand that you and Debbie couldn't agree this time not least because you've taken on a new title and arguably after being a dad, the second most important job you've ever had, namely being a grandpa. So uh, it's really, really good to see you. I was intrigued as I looked at the agenda for this weekend's uh, conference and as I've been getting uh, live blogged from se several of my friends here in the, in the audience about the developments uh, of the conference. Each and every day for the last three years, we've been confronted by the new Middle East. 
This is one of the most important challenges to and the biggest opportunities for our national security. And I can't think of a better group to navigate these policy issues, uh, these policy waters with, than the friends and colleagues assembled here today. I want to personally express my appreciation for the important work that the Institute does and its fellows and personnel do inside and outside the government to strengthen our national security and advance our mutual understanding that can lead to a safer world. And let me express on the President's behalf his thanks for the Institute's work as well. Let me offer one more word of thanks to a member of the President's team uh, who's been doing a lot of work on this speech, namely Rob Waller, who's in the back. He's our Director for Israel, Palestine, uh, Palestinian, and Jordanian Affairs, and is here with me today. Importantly, he'll be leaving the National Security Staff later this summer for his follow-on assignment as the Principal office, Officer for the consul, uh, Consulate General in Dubai. So thank you, Rob, for all you've done this weekend. <laughs> well, I'll miss you, too. Listen, the discussion this weekend is timely. Across the Middle East, it's a moment of tr profound transformation and, as is always true with transformation, tremendous uncertainty. A new generation is asserting itself, demanding its universal rights and the opportunity to determine its own future and destiny. There are now four active democratic transitions underway. Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, and Yemen. For the first time, in nine years, we don't have American troops fighting in Iraq. And for the first time in more than 20 years, we don't have American jets patrolling Iraq's skies. Instead, we have a few hundred trainers helping to strengthen a multi-ethnic military that serves a multi-ethnic and multi-sectarian government. Syria is in the midst of a transition the government so lacking in legitimacy that it stays in power only through brute force against its own people. It's clear that Assad must go, and it is only a matter of time until he will go. And Iran is more isolated, and its legitimacy more in question than any time since 1979. Each of these changes was unthinkable a couple years ago, and each of them is fundamentally in the national interest of the United States. This is a time of opportunity and risk, a moment that requires both, both vision and vigilance. And today I want to talk about both, namely how President Obama approaches this challenge in a way that advances the aspirations of the people in the region, as well as the national security interests of the, of the United States of America. To begin, I think it's important to understand the approach in the, the President's approach in the context of how his national security policies have advanced U.S. interests and changed how we uh, engage the world. In 2008, the United States was fighting two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and Osama bin Laden was at large. Relations with key allies were strained, and Iran was, by any sense or any measure, ascendant. The President came into office and established a straightforward and pragmatic framework for dealing with national security issues. It's non-ideological, marked by a clear understanding and enunciation of our interests and goals, a rigorous decision-making process that accounts for both risks and opportunities, a sense of humility and recognition of our values, and a determination to do exactly what we say. Just look at the past year to see how the President has applied this framework and has done what he said he would do in order to make America, our allies, and the international community more secure. The Iraq War has ended and the war in Afghanistan is winding down. Last week, I had the privilege of traveling with the President to Kabul, where he signed an historic strategic partnership agreement, defining the long-term relationship between the United States and Afghanistan as a next step and bringing that war to a responsible conclusion. Libya is in the midst of reconstruction after four decades of misrule by Muammar Gaddafi, and the President has concentrated the war on Al-Qaeda such that Osama bin Laden is dead, and that terrorist organization now weaker than at any time since before 9-11, and it's on its path to defeat. 
president has applied the same framework to Iran. When he took office, the Iranian re regime thought itself ascendant. Externally, Iran's reach seemed to be longer than ever, and the international community was divided on how to deal with its illicit nuclear program. Multilateral diplomacy had stalled, and around the world, many had begun to give Iran the benefit of the doubt, blaming, somehow blaming the United States for the tensions over Iran's nuclear program. As Tom Donilon, as Robert just said, told you all last year, President Obama was determined to reverse this dangerous dynamic, to highlight the danger of Iran's illicit program, one, incidentally, that it's pursuing at great, great cost to its own people, and to isolate Iran rather than the United States. That determination is beginning to pay off. He has repeatedly stressed his determination to prevent Iran from obtaining nuclear weapons and has consistently given Tehran a choice. Fulfill your international obligations or face increasing pressure. To date, Iran has refused. And so, together with our partners, we have put in place the strongest sanctions that the Iranian government has ever faced. As a result, Iran finds itself isolated from the international community, finds it harder than ever to acquire materials for its nuclear and weapons program, and to conduct transactions in dollars and euros. It struggled to buy refined petroleum and the goods it needs to maintain and modernize its oil and gas sector. It's unable to access over half its foreign currency reserves, and its currency has lost over half its value since this time last year. Throughout that country, Iranians are turning to gold to secure their assets, and the Iranian government has introduced strict controls on the sale and purchase of foreign currencies. This is the pain and misery that the regime itself has imposed on the Iranian people. Leading global companies have stopped doing business there, and more recently, we, working with Congress and our international partners, have increased pressure on Iran by targeting its central bank and its oil exports, the main source of its revenue. The results have been significant, in fact, far greater than we would have anticipated. With countries throughout the world acting to reduce their purchase of Iranian oil and to reduce their exposure to Iran's financial system. I should note that 11 countries so far have significantly reduced their imports of Iranian oil. Others have indicated their intent to do so, including countries as diverse as South Korea and Turkey. And we expect still others to indicate a similar intent in the coming days and weeks. The purpose of this pressure is not punishment. It is to convince Iran that the price of pursuing nuclear weapons is too high and that the time is now to make good on its commitments to the international community. And it's time for Iran's leaders to answer why it refuses to prove its peaceful intentions, instead further isolating its own people, choosing to pay the price of intransigence rather than joining the international community of nations. It's not only the re regime's actions, however, that are isolating it. It is also being isolated as a result of the historic transformation in the Middle East. In 1979, Iran laid claim to be the vanguard of change in the region. Yet, for more than a year now, we've watched as the Iranian government and its institutions, most principally the IRGC, have tried to claim the mantle of change in the region, indeed even trying to hijack it. But after ruthlessly crushing its own Persian Spring in June 2009, Iran cannot credibly lay claim to the popular and peaceful movements we have witnessed in the streets of Cairo, Tripoli, Tunis, Damascus, and elsewhere. At its core, the change we are seeing in the region is driven by a fundamental human desire for individual rights, dignity, and freedom. This model of change has discredited the model of change through violence that Iran has shopped now for 30 years. In Syria, Iran is on the wrong side of history, forced to back its only ally in the region with people, money, and weapons as that regime systematically suppresses and even kills its own citizens. Tehran fears the end of the Assad regime for, 
for it knows it would be a strategic blow, leaving it isolated in the region, crippling its ability to project its influence, and weakening, weakening its violent proxies. It's no wonder, then, that Iran is so pop unpopular in the Arab world. Our, Iran's favorability among our Arabs plummeted from over 70 percent six years ago to an average of 25 percent today. And so it's clear that the change we are witnessing in the region is not opening the door to a greater, greater Iranian influence. Today, a dynamic region is moving away from, and frankly beyond, Iran, not towards it. We know that, and importantly, we know and have seen that Iran leaders know and are fearful of exactly that trend. At the same time, and as many of you have been debating uh, with your panelists over the last couple of days. While the change in the Middle East is working against Iran, it is our conviction that it can and is working for the United States. President Obama firmly believes that we have an historic opportunity to align our interests and our values, even as we acknowledge the very real challenges and risks in this time of significant transition. A more democratic region will ultimately be more stable for us and our friends, and as a result, more secure for all of us. What the Arab Spring has unearthed in the region is that people are profoundly longing for dignity, greater opportunity, and more of a say in charting their own future. As Americans, we understand that motivation, for it's at our very core, and we celebrate it. And they are finding our friends in the Arab world are finding that not in the ideas from Tehran or elsewhere, but rather in the ideals and principles that we here hold dear. Over the long term, that trajectory is fundamentally good for the region and good for the United States. It plays to our comparative strengths as a nation, and it is worth our investment. It portends a region that is more secure, more open, and more economically vibrant just as we see its populations getting younger and more demanding of governments that are more accountable and that put the needs of citizens first. As we have seen over the past year, this change won't be smooth or linear, and there is always the potential for backsliding and painful, very painful adjustments along the way. But change has arrived, and to act as if we can either stop it or ignore it is not a recipe for stability. It, in fact, is the most risky option. And, incidentally, it's not consistent with our values. At the same time, we are confident that, as we manage this change, we can continue to work with our partners to advance our shared interests, to cooperate on counterterrorism issues, oppose the spread of nuclear weapons, confront Iran's illicit program, support the free flow of oil and gas that's critical to the world's economy. Let me take a minute to discuss the three issues that you've spent the most time on this weekend, Egypt, Syria, and Middle East peace. The most important transition for the region is undoubtedly in Egypt. Egypt has always been at the heart of the center, has always been at the heart of the Arab world, and as such, the success or failure of its transition to democracy will have a lasting impact on the region. We've supported this transition because it's consistent with our values and our interests. The past year in Egypt has not been without its challenges. But while acknowledging how much farther the transition in Egypt has to go, let's take a minute to acknowledge how far it's come. For the first time in, its, in modern history, Egypt has a freely elected parliament. Its media is freer than it's ever been. In a few and in a few weeks, Egyptians will go to polls to elect their new president, to whom the military has committed to transferring power by July. Many challenges remain, like ensuring protection of individual rights, including those of Coptic Christians, and the role of civil society. But Egyptians are now debating these issues in a way that will allow them to build, we believe, a better and ultimately more stable future. The United States has made clear that we want to be a partner in Egypt's success in helping the Egyptian people realize their aspirations. That's why we move quickly to engage all parties in Egypt that forsake violence, including the Muslim Brotherhood. 
and are working with newly elected parliamentarians and others to improve the treatment of NGOs, help Egypt reform its security system sector, and attract outside investment and trade. While we pursue these new lines of efforts, we have acted to protect our strategic relationship with the, with the Egyptian military. That is a principal benefit to both our countries and undergirds regional security. It will take time for us to build a new relationship with the Egyptian people, just as it will take time for them to consolidate their democracy. But we are laying the foundation to achieve our common goals. Even as we work with the Egyptian people to build this better future, we have made known to all parties in Egypt and in the region our strategic interests, including the protection of the Treaty of Peace between Egypt, Egypt and Israel, and continued cooperation on counterterrorism. In this regard, we're working intensively with Egypt and Israel to focus attention and resources on the situation on the Sinai Peninsula, which is a threat to the security of both countries. We have been encouraged by the commitments we've received so far, but will continue to judge actions there, not by words, but by deeds. Let me now say a little bit about Syria, where the Syrian people are subjected to unspeakable violence simply for demanding their universal rights. There is no question that as Assad clings to power, his brutal tactics will continue and further destabilize Syria and possibly the region. For that reason, we're working very closely and intensively with allies and partners to pressure Assad to step down so that a Syrian-led democratic transition can be finalized. As the President made clear at the Holocaust Museum last month, with allies and partners, we'll keep increasing the pressure with a diplomatic effort to further isolate Assad and his regime so that those who stick with Assad know that they are casting a losing bet. We'll work to weaken the lifeline that Syria's economy provides to its leaders by increasing sanctions and cutting off the regime from money it needs to survive. And we continue documenting the atrocities so killers know that they will face justice while we lead the world in a humanitarian effort to get relief and medicine to the Syrian people. We'll continue to work inside the Security Council and outside of it with the Friends of Syria to increase support for the Syrian opposition while it goes stronger. A political solution is the best way to address this crisis, to ensure the legitimate aspirations of the Syrian people are realized, and that it would help lay the groundwork for a Syrian-led transition in the most stable way possible. That's why, as part of our efforts, we support Joint Special Envoy Kofi Annan's mission and are working with our partners to press the Assad regime to implement his peace plan. The bottom line is that our efforts are meant to help the Syrian people realize a future that includes a pluralistic government that guarantees fundamental rights, including the protection of all minority communities, and governs based on principles of democracy, basic human rights, and human dignity. That Syria will contribute to regional stability and security and undercut the efforts of Iran. And amid all of this change and all of these new opportunities, old challenges remain. Most vexing and elusive of all, of course, is Middle East peace. I know this audience is well versed in U.S. efforts to advance the cause of peace, as you are all well aware of how much this president has done for Israel and its security. So rather than covering familiar territory, let me tell you why the time has come to think differently about this age-old problem. As I mentioned early, earlier, and as you yourselves have discussed at length this weekend, the changes underway in the region are profound. And over the long term, the values that the region is embracing, free speech, democracy, dignity, political reform, freedom of the press, economic opportunity and entrepreneurship make the promise of, new, of a Middle East peace not less but more achievable and even more urgent. Peace is the best guarantor of lasting security, but at the same time, a secure Israel will have the confidence to make peace. No president since Harry Truman has done as much for Israel's security as Barack Obama. Record levels of security assistance, the Iron Dome rocket system, which as recently as a few weeks ago intercepted 80 to 85 percent of rockets aimed at Gaza, aimed from Gaza at Israeli homes, hospitals, and schools. 
the largest ever joint military exercises, the most comprehensive consultations between our political, military, and intelligence leaders, and in the president himself, a president who has stood up repeatedly, sadly often alone, against attempts to delegitimize, delegitimize Israel in international organizations. In the midst of all these challenges and change, new leaders will emerge in the region that will hold accountable, will be held accountable to their people and must deliver progress. They will not be able to distract their public from domestic failures by attempting to scapegoat Israel, the United States, or other parties. And I think most people in the region are interested in casting off the burdens of the past, fundamentally want peace, and believe that there is a way to resolve it. As access to information increases and citizens become more empowered, they can play a bigger role in crafting that lasting peace. Others say that our peace efforts have taken a back seat to the events around the region. I'm here to tell you that's simply not true. For just as dictatorial re rule in the region was unsustainable, so too is the burden of conflict between the Israelis and Palestinians. That is why we will continue to be relentless in pushing for peace between the parties. Free societies are ultimately more stable, and because peace between free peoples uh, will, be more will be more resilient as a result. It's in that context and with that goal in mind that peace is more urgent. No one under understands that better than the Israelis, who recently celebrated the 64th anniversary of their independence. Israel stands to gain more from the realization of freedom in the region than anyone. In a, region, in a regional system that finds itself more free, more transparent, and more entrepreneurial, the countries, namely Israel and the United States, that are most free, most transparent, and most entrepreneurial, cannot help but lead and are uniquely poised to succeed. That is the main reason to be optimistic about this new Middle East that you've discussed all weekend. In that new Middle East, our interests and our security are enhanced even when it appears they're most threatened. All the while, the United States will be a stalwart ally and friend of Israel. And I can assure you that we'll never waver in our pursuit of peace. In closing, in the year since the, since the administration came to office, the president has not only charted a bold course, he's followed it. He not only set difficult goals, he had the determination and persistence to achieve them from putting Al-Qaeda on the path to defeat, to putting the toughest sanctions ever on Iran, and to providing unprecedented support for Israel's security, the President has navigated this new Middle East while advancing America's national security interests and staying true to the values that we cherish most. And he will continue to do so, guided by those principles, and hopeful and excited by the multitude of opportunities even as we are mindful of these many risks and challenges that lay ahead. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions, Dennis. Next, that's fine. Uh, Dennis, thank you very much. That was a comprehensive overview, and I'm going to ask um, a number of questions that are designed to, uh, I think, build on what you said and, and maybe draw you a little bit more out on some of them. And I want to do it in the spirit that's uh, kind of consistent with what's emerged, as you yourself noted, from, the, from a weekend of discussions here. F let me start with Egypt, because Friday night we had uh, Nagid Sawiris here, who was really maybe the leading liberal secular figure in Egypt, and he gave a pretty remarkable presentation. Uh, the most, I think, impressive element, aside from who he is, was his description of the Muslim Brotherhood in which he described them as being dictatorial uh, and unlikely to easily surrender power. He wasn't going to give up. He, the last thing he wanted was to see the failure of Egypt, but he was clearly giving us a very strong warning on the Muslim Brotherhood. So I, I would like to ask you, um, in light of what we heard and in light of what you were just saying about Egypt and the approach, what is our approach to the Muslim Brotherhood and what happens if the Muslim Brotherhood reflects what Nagid was saying 
do you believe that the Muslim Brotherhood is really going to be open to accepting repeatable elections and accepting some of the principles that we hold so dearly? Yeah, it's, uh, I think having him as your opening speaker is a testament to the, kind of the strength of the program that you guys have put together uh, this weekend, Dennis. He's a remarkable guy. Um, I'd say a couple things. One, we're eyes wide open about the challenges uh, in Egypt and uh, the challenges with uh, many of the parties. Two, uh, the challenge I think for us is for, and the challenge for the parties, is to go from a period of uh, um, uh, ideological development, uh, party development, idea development, to governance. And uh, I think the, there's, uh, what we're seeing is that within the Brotherhood, there's uh, strands of uh, thinking that kind of cover the spectrum. That's to be expected in a big party. Um, how they bring that together with governance uh, is going to be their biggest challenge uh, as they proceed. And in that regard, uh, the international system and regional uh, developments play in, in the favor of requiring greater transparency, undercutting the ability of any individual or particular party to be dictatorial. Uh, because as you look at some of the challenges that are facing Egypt today, uh, very difficult uh, economic uh, situation, uh, challenge with uh, getting growth back of the type that they had been uh, living with for so many years. And th there will be tremendous pressure on whoever the next government is uh, to live up to the standards of the international community to be able to bring back not only support of the international financial institutions, but even more importantly, uh, sources of hard revenue like uh, tourism, uh, which is a huge source of jobs and frankly still is not as developed as it has been. So uh, we're eyes wide open on this. We're mindful that certain of the developments within the region and requirements of governance as a matter of uh, course for any government today is going to press uh, toward greater transparency and openness because that's what investors are going to demand. Uh, but ultimately, also, uh, we think that as a result of more empowered individuals, more empowered Egyptians, uh, even if somebody wants to be dictatorial, it's going to be very difficult for them to do that. Um, so again, eyes wide open, Dennis, big challenge. Um, but we have to harness all the different uh, capabilities here as these guys come to power for the first time, frankly, ever, to demonstrate whether or not they can, uh, they can do uh, what governments are supposed to do, which is uh, make sure that they're uh, accounting for access and opportunity for their people. Thank you. I'm going to kind of cover the spectrum of what we were covering here. So let me turn to Iran. Uh, one of the, I think one of the elements or themes that emerged from the discussions was very clearly uh, that the U.S. and Israel have a shared objective, which is the prevention, not the containment uh, of an Iran with nuclear weapons, but the prevention of Iran from getting nuclear weapons, but there is now a diplomatic process underway. And I think one of the concerns that some have about the diplomatic process is that it could drag on past the point at which Israel would lose its ability to deal militarily with a threat that Israel sees as being existential. Is this a concern um, that at least we've discussed with the Israelis? Are we mindful in this diplomatic process? that the Iranians could simply seek to drag it on in a way that allows them to pursue their nuclear program at the same time? Uh, and where are we in terms of how we look at that process and this particular Israeli concern? Yeah, it's a good question. And, uh, you know, you and I like to talk about sports a lot, Dennis. It's like, it's great. It's, it's not, it's, I guess, a moral victory to shoot a lot of, make a lot of baskets after the game's over, right? So here's the deal. We're, we're playing uh, the real game here. We're not saving shots for after uh, the game's over. We recognize what the time is here. And what, as a result, frankly, of your good work, Dennis, and as a result of the, the good working relationship between the Prime Minister and the President, and the intensive collaborative effort that we've had uh, on intelligence and uh, sharing and otherwise, uh, what we have is uh, 
almost identical assessment of uh, various timelines uh, that we're uh, that we're looking at uh, with the Iranians. That's one. Two. We uh, are even as we undertake the P5 plus one effort, for example, are in very close consultation uh, with our Israeli friends as we head into each of these sessions. Number three, we're not asking for more time uh, to let negotiations work because we're betting on negotiations. Uh, we are saying something uh, which is different, which is uh, we believe the policy that we are pursuing is working. And ultimately, that is going to uh, give us the best opportunity to address this challenge once and for all. Uh, it's a multi-pronged effort uh, that includes, obviously, diplomacy and various forms of pressure, some of which I just talked about. Um, but also, uh, as the President has said, uh, it leaves uh, all other options on the table as well. The, so at the end of the day, this question of time, as I say, how you perform during the game is what matters here. Uh, we're not looking for, you know, something to happen after the game. We know what the game is. We know what the timeline is. Uh, we're being very transparent with, uh, with our allies in this effort to include the Israelis and, frankly, have been quite clear uh, with the Iranians that we're not involved in a negotiating effort here for the sake of negotiations. We recognize what we have to get done, when we have to get it done by, and we're using, believe me, all elements of our national power to ensure that we get it done. Let me, going with the flow of the, of the sequence of the events here, Syria. We had a very um, lively discussion last night uh, with a panel of people with diverse perspectives, but there is, uh, one issue here, and, and you know, you made it very clear uh, again that Assad must go and that he and that he will go. There is an argument on the part of some that there shouldn't be greater uh, activism or intervention against Assad because that will increase the level of violence, produce a civil war, um, you know weaken the power of central authorities, uh, create the basis for some kind of failed state. And yet there are those who would say it's precisely allowing Assad to continue doing what he's doing, which is going to harden the sectarian divide to the point where it'll be irreparable, that that will actually split the country apart and lead to producing a failed state. So the, the need to hasten his departure is actually the key to avoiding some of the very things that some people argue would be the occasion to greater activism or intervention. At this point, I know you, you addressed some of the things we're doing, but I, how do you deal with this concern about the longer this drags on, the more likely the worst outcome may actually materialize in Syria? Yeah, I mean, this is the, this, uh, you know, the, the big question, the million dollar question, and I gather that, uh, you know, uh, Professor Ajami and others address this uh, very, um, shall we say, robustly last night. Uh, it's a good euphemism, yeah. <laughs> um, look, it's a, tough, it's a tough call. And um, the, the question is, obviously, how you define intervention uh, in, uh, in the region. We obviously, as Secretary Clinton has uh, coordinated and talked about with the Friends of Syria, are uh, working to strengthen uh, the Syrian opposition. We have obviously looked for opportunities to help them communicate both what they plan for the future of Syria, but also what's happening uh, in Syria now. Um, the, the question, and we'll continue to work very closely uh, with our friends in the regions, the Turks, the Jordanians, Saudis, uh, and others, uh, because of the, the, the strategic location of Syria and because the fundamental uh, point you've made about uh, in your analysis, Dennis, which is the longer this goes on, the worse it is uh, for everybody because that will only harden the sectarian nature uh, and the sectarian divides within the country. Um, 
But the, the question at the end of the day is, as you, you started with your question, which is, if you want to hasten the, the um, transition, the, the completion of the transition, uh, what are the tools that you would imply, uh, apply to ensure that? Right now, we, are, we have made an effort uh, to work with our Russian, Chinese, uh, and other Security Council uh, partners to increase the pressure on him from non-traditional sources. Uh, frankly, that private pressure uh, from some of those uh, parties is uh, having an impact. That's one. Deepen their isolation, including isolating them from their traditional sources of support. Two, uh, making an aggressive run at the lifeline, as I said uh, in my remarks, of cash uh, and resources that keeps the regime and its uh, pillars of support in place. Those uh, sanctions, to include, incidentally, an EU oil embargo of uh, Syria, uh, which was, uh, we kind of take these things as kind of expected now, as a pretty historic move, um, are also having an impact. The, we are communicating very clearly in such a way that uh, the Syrian military understands that the, we are uh, recording this act, the, these activities that they're undertaking such that uh, when the transition is complete, they'll be held to account. And the question is whether you make the leap to the next step, which is either the United States uh, undertakes military action or enables others to take, uh, take military action. I think as you've heard in Secretary Clinton and Secretary Panetta's remarks, obviously we plan for every contingency in the event we need that. But we just don't think the analysis at the moment is that uh, we, don't, we do not believe that uh, intervention hastens the demise of the regime. Uh, rather, it's continued isolation, choking off cash and resources and calling out to the world in a very public way, as we have now over the last three months, the activities uh, as we, address, as we uh, catalog them is a way to erode the, the pillars of power, ultimately to, to induce the change that we need. Um, if that, that's analysis that we're constantly re-looking at. Um, and uh, the, the, the fundamental goal of, the, of the United States, which incidentally is a goal that uh, all the neighbors share, is that uh, Assad can't stay, uh, that his continued uh, power, his continuance in power uh, will only, as you say, deepen the sectarian divides and ultimately lead to even greater insecurity. We believe we've got the winning recipe, but we'll continue to look at it as it comes along. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, you went with the president to uh, to Kabul this week, and it was the uh, the anniversary of the uh, mission against Osama bin Laden. When you look at uh, Al Qaeda today, would you say that it's been defeated, uh, or would you say that it's been weakened? And where do we go from here in terms of how we look at Al Qaeda as a as a threat, yeah. Al Qaeda and its offshoots? Well, I, the, uh, I will say that the trip to Kabul was, it was very remarkable. Uh, it's always a huge, uh, it's hugely energizing to see our guys uh, in the field, civilian and uh, military alike. Um, you know, guys like Rob and, uh, and others who are out there without their families, really working uh, unbelievably hard. I think that, um, you know, every once in a while you're also wondering, you know, how, how does this stuff all add up? You know, we, you, remember this, Dennis, you kind of live in a bubble, you know, you go from the sit room, uh, you're there for all day, then you go into your office, if you're lucky you have the TV on so you can hear a little news, you read the newspapers, but you don't really interact with what's going on, so you're not really sure whether you're registering, but this morning actually I woke up and I, you remember this too, Dennis, you get the sit room updates overnight, a lot of times you don't want to open those, but I opened one today that I really liked because it was a statement from the Iranian Foreign Ministry saying that they opposed the strategic partnership agreement with Afghanistan. So I figured, thought to myself, there's, actually there's evidence that what we're doing is doing exactly the right thing. So um, anyway, it's rare that you get such a, a clear endorsement of, of a good uh, policy move. Uh, but 
so where do we go with Al-Qaeda from here? Uh, you know, we've been really, what we've seen over the course of the last uh, three years, is, as you recall, Dennis, is kind of the uh, franchisement of uh, the Al-Qaeda brand. Al-Qaeda in, is in the lands of the Islamic Maghreb, uh, obviously, in North Africa is uh, stronger. Uh, the Al-Qaeda on the Arabian Peninsula is uh, uh, stronger than it was uh, over the last several years. Al-Qaeda's senior leadership, its leadership in, in Pakistan, we believe, is weaker than it has been, uh, as I suggested. By no means defeated, still uh, bound and determined to attack us and our interest, uh, but weaker uh, than it has been as a result of a concerted effort uh, against the whole leadership, not just uh, bin Laden, but the whole leadership, which I think has been successful. Uh, but these guys are opportunistic, and they're dastardly, and as you look at the franchisement of the brand in Yemen, uh, in East Africa, in North Africa, and increasingly in West Africa, as they look to kind of hit, hitch their wagon to ascended capabilities, like Boko Haram, for example, in Nigeria, these guys are going to be, uh, continue to be a challenge for us and a threat to us. So uh, the, the, the goal here is not to let down, let our, our guard down or not to uh, diffuse our, uh, kind of our attention to this. It's to stay on top of the analysis and make sure we remain as focused as we have been on Al-Qaeda. One of the big changes, when we've seen this, uh, frankly now it's been reported in the press, so I can talk about this a little bit. A lot of the sensitive um, site exploitation that came out of the Abbottabad raid pointed to frustration from bin Laden and his top lieutenants that as a result of our focus squarely on Al-Qaeda rather than the more diffuse focus on a war on terrorism, uh, they felt like they were losing uh, its followers, that they were uh, seen, I think as was reported in the press earlier this week, as um, uh, not on the same side as Muslims, because Al-Qaeda has been killing uh, principally Muslims now uh, for the last 15 years. We think that kind of targeted focus, continued uh, uh, depth analysis, willingness, as I said, to uh, recognize risk but not be paralyzed by it, um, has led us to take some uh, fairly big moves, but we're by no means done. And as I said before, the game is still, the clock's still running on the game here, and we're going to stay, we're going to keep running through the tape. Uh, keep running through or playing through the, the, at the end of the game. I got a sign from Rob that we, no? Oh, oh okay. sorry. Oh, so that wasn't the sign to, <laughs> usually I take the cues really well. Um, all right, so we got time for a couple more? Okay. Um, so you touched on it in your, in your remarks, but uh, you know, you're not surprised by the question I'm about to ask. I also get this question a lot, but I'm not going to direct it towards you. There's a lot of people constantly ask about the relationship between the president and the prime minister of Israel. Uh, and how would, how would you talk about it? How would you describe it? That's a good question, and I get the question a lot, too. Um, so maybe what we could do is let me incorporate your remarks right here in mine. No, I'm just kidding. A um, couple things. One is uh, there's no president, there's no leader uh, that the president has spent more time with uh, than Prime Minister Netanyahu. Incidentally, that goes back to before the period uh, when they were both in uh, the offices they're in now. Um, and uh, I think that's uh, allowed them to kind of have an understanding of each other, both out of office and in office. Uh, that's one. Two is I think, um, I think it's, uh, it's, as I suggested in my, in my um, comments, it's a workmanlike relationship. Uh, these are two very determined individuals. They both have a range of challenges. And so, and these are guys, uh, I think, you know, you, you know President Obama as well as I do, Dennis, and you know Prime Minister Netanyahu much better than I do. But I'm always struck as we sit down with the president uh, with him or as we get readouts from the president of his conversations or as we, uh, uh, you know, look back at the conversations that there's not a whole lot of kind of small talk. This is like, let's get to business, let's work through the issues, uh, and let's get to conclusions. And I think, frankly, uh, 
that sometimes gets misunderstood uh, as somehow a lack of warmth or a lack of uh, uh, friendship. I actually like to see it the other way, which is these are serious guys who recognize that there are unbelievably serious challenges facing the United States and Israel. They have a kind of a comfort level now or a fluency with uh, fluidity with one another personally that allows them to kind of let their guard down and to not kind of flower up their discussions but rather get right into the heart of the matter. And I f think, frankly, at the end of the day, um, that's fundamentally in our interest. Uh, and I think it's in uh, Israel's interest. Now, um, the, the one thing that uh, I'm sure uh, you suggest when you get this question too, Dennis, is that what we see is um, a lot of, there's a whole set of policy issues that just somehow end up, you, they get passed through this funhouse, um, funhouse mirrors of the press and uh, of leaks that end up having it come out the other end in, in a way that's just fundamentally distorted. So if you can't judge by what you're reading in the papers about what the relationship is like, and uh, you don't want to take my word for it as a guy who's, you know, I'm close to the president, so you, you want to make sure I'm not spinning you, then what do you do? Well, then you look at the outcomes of the relationship. More security assistance than at any time ever from uh, the U.S. to Israel. More targeted and particular types of security assistance, like Iron Dome. Uh, greater interaction across the full range of national security issues um, than ever, with very regular and incidentally very high level interactions between our teams. Um, and so, you know, I, we, we, always, we used to say this when you were there, Dennis, we still say it, we're a kind of a pay for performance operation, you know, we, we recognize that, you know, everybody, you know, talk is cheap and, and, you know, performance is what it's all about. And so I guess I just ask, when I get asked this question, I always ask it in return, which is, are you comfortable with what you're seeing in the relationship? The cooperation that you're seeing, the, the level of interaction, and the fact that on an issue, for example, like Iran, we have basically, as you said at the, at the, with the second question, basically shared strategic objective. Um, we have the institutions in place and the, the working groups in place to work through each of the uh, pieces thereof. So um, in the pay for performance department, I think we're performing. But last point, and this one gets back to that question earlier, the game's not over. And so nobody's declaring victory be that on Iran or be that on Israeli-Palestinian matters or larger Arab-Israeli issues. Um, all I can do is say at this point in the game, uh, we have uh, a game plan, we have fluency and fluidity between the teams and we're working this thing. And I feel a lot better about where we are vis-a-vis -vis the Iranians uh, and where the, incidentally, where the Iranians are vis-a-vis -vis the world than I did uh, a couple years ago. So let me ask one last question, which is a kind of um, overarching kind of question. Uh, every administration I've ever been a part of comes in with a set of assumptions about what they're going to face, and every administration I've ever been a part of ends up facing a world that is not the one they entirely expected, and there are inevitably surprises, uh, and it affects the kind of assumptions that you, you brought to the table. When it comes to the broader Middle East, obviously there has been a profound surprise because nobody predicted what is described alternatively as the Arab Spring, the Arab Awakening, the Arab upheaval. Uh, how has that affected the assumptions that the administration uh, has, has brought to bear when it, when it comes to the area? It's a good, it's a good question. It's a tough question. Um, the, I guess I'd answer it in three ways. First, as it relates to, uh, you know, 
my sense is, and I get this sense because I used to work with a guy who's done this for an awful long time, and so he's seen a lot of relationships between presidents and uh, leaders in the, um, in the region. But uh, one of the big assumptions would, namely, that you could pick up the phone and call President Mubarak, and you could have a very difficult, tough, you know, hard-hitting conversation, but at the end of the day, you could kind of get uh, could kind of get agreement and get a, a chart a path forward. Well, that's kind of gone, right? Uh, you don't have the uh, single interlocutor that you can just call in a country as important a, uh, as Egypt. Um, you obviously have, uh, you know, we have a series of very important interlocutors who are working, uh, but you're also in the midst of a transition, so everybody's wondering what comes next. That's assumption number one. Assumption number two, you remember the debate in 2008 uh, really revolved around Iraq in a lot of ways as it relates to national security. I'm actually surprised, uh, having spent a lot of time, I was just emailing this morning with Ambassador Jeffrey, uh, who incidentally had this job before he went out to, to Turkey and then to Iraq. Um, I'm surprised at the situation we find ourselves in Iraq. Um, despite all the... Uh, kind of the national debate and uh, the difficulty of that debate and the difficulty of those years in 2006, 2007. Uh, we find ourselves, as I said in my uh, remarks, in a situation which ironically might be one of the more profound developments in the new Middle East, where you have a multi-ethnic, albeit imperfect, but a multi-ethnic, multi-sectarian government in Iraq that seems to be working. You have a uh, multi-ethnic uh, military that is living up to its obligations heretofore. Um, and again, that doesn't mean everything is going terrifically. But the assumption I had about the challenges that we were going to face on a day-to-day -day basis with Iraq just haven't, uh, haven't played out. Um, lastly, um, I think the, uh, the, um, the assumption also that we would have, uh, now maybe this heats up again uh, with uh, onset of the campaign and everything, but I think that over the course of the last three years or so, we've had a um, relatively non-ideological, uh, relatively uh, straightforward and nonpartisan foreign policy, um, both I think because of the, 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 the uh, intensity of the Iraq debate um, and given that I was really coming into government from the campaign, which is by, na by its very nature more, more uh, pugilistic or more kind of combative, I've been struck by the, our ability to, to work uh, very closely across partisan lines. Uh, and I think that's a testament, one, to the recognition that we have a lot of challenges as a country, and people are kind of coming together on those. Two, uh, I think it's... Um, a testament to what I said in terms of one of the big pieces of the president's framework. It's a non-ideological framework. Uh, we've taken some gruff, uh, some grief for that, um, but I'm very comfortable with where we are, and I think that, frankly, is an assumption that hasn't played out. Now, there's all sorts of developments on the ground uh, in different places uh, that I would not have expected, um, and uh, those pop up in strange ways, uh, China, Pakistan, um, and just individual cases that really, uh, at the end of the day, challenge your, your framework, challenge your strategies. Uh, but if, if you don't manage those individual cases, you lose control of your ability to, con to run the whole strategy. And so I think, frankly, uh, uh, those, I didn't know that coming into this. It's obviously obvious to a guy like you who's done this for a long time. Um, but I think, frankly, we've been able to manage those as a general matter, too.